It's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown, out there on the edge of the prairie. Drove up here this last week in the cold and the ice because I needed to get some of this uh, plaster that uh, has been in our family for years. You put on your chest if you have a cold. Uh, It has ginger juice in it, and it has goose grease, and it has mustard. But you have to make it from fresh mustard that you've grown out of the garden. You can't take something out of a jar. We've used it over the years in our family. Used it... uh, Used it for, for fractured skulls and uh, arthritis and colds, everything except outright depression, and uh, and it's always worked for us. And my aunt Flo is now the caretaker of the secrets of Grandma's old mustard plaster. I needed it because I had this horrible, horrible cold with a terrible cough. It was the worst cough I've ever had in my life. It was this deep, phlegmy sort of cough that when you coughed it, people edged away. <laughs> you really could empty a room fast with a cough like that. It was, like, it was a, like a wolf. It was a deep, feral animal bark. And once you started, you just couldn't stop. So I went up to see Aunt Flo, feeling bad about my cough. Got up there mid-afternoon on a brilliant winter day and fell in behind the big orange school bus as it drove along the county road and stopped every every quarter mile or so, let off a bunch of children, stopped and let off four of them. They crossed and flipped out its red stop sign, put on the flashes. I recognized my cousin's kid crossing the road. There were four kids. I rolled down my window to yell to him. I saw that he had headphones on, this boy. I went to yell to him, and instead I coughed, this tremendous (laughs) cough that made you think of people dying of tuberculosis in sanitariums. It sounded like a Rottweiler at the wheel of a car. And these kids turned, and they looked at me, And they zipped up their jackets. They actually zipped up their jackets. Some of them reached into their pockets and put on hats. These are kids. Kids are immortal, but they heard that cough. And they knew what that cough was about. That cough is about death. No way around it. Oh, my. It was a horrible cough. I got there to my Aunt Flo. She was feeling kind of achy from arthritis, so I didn't mention my cough right away, but then I had to because I started coughing. It was a horrible, horrible, deep cough. It sounded like I was about to cough up big chunks of my lung. She said, you know, you need some of Grandma's plaster is what you need. She said, I was thinking of making soup anyway. She said, and I've got to I've got to squeeze ginger juice to make my carrot soup, so at least we can get that. I don't have any goose grease. I don't have any of that mustard. But we'll find that anyway. So she started in cooking. It was one of those gray, snowy days when you feel like cooking, just the right day for it. This carrot soup is a beautiful soup, by the way. You put in a couple pounds of carrots, and you peel them, and you chop them up, and you cook them for about half an hour in about a quart of water, and then you grate ginger root, and you squeeze it, you put it down on a cutting board that has little gutters around it, and you squeeze it hard with a spatula, and you make the juice run, and you put a little bit of that juice into that carrot soup and a little whipping cream, and it's just the most wonderful, wonderful thing, soup. She was in a soup mood. She got started on the carrot soup, and then she decided to make a little bit of chili. Got out her old Betty Crocker cookbook, and just to remind herself of the recipe, though, of course, she knew it by heart, where you brown the meat along with the chopped onions and the garlic, and you put it in, and you chop up the carrot, and you chop up the celery, and you put in some basil, and you put in some chili powder and some cumin, and maybe some potatoes, and it sits there and simmers and... 
the kitchen fills up with the fragrance of chili. Then she thought, I'll make some bread. I might as well make some bread. She got out flour. She got out sugar. She got out yeast and salt and milk, and she started to make flour. Her old Betty Crocker cookbook sitting there like a trophy, all kind of falling apart, held together by masking tape, and the pages of the most familiar old recipes, you know, for gingerbread and bread and coffee cake, fallen completely out, stained with grease, old recipes. But she knows them by heart anyway. Knows them like the Lord's Prayer. You just measure out and you mix and you knead the dough for about five minutes or until the dough is sort of elastic and then you push hard with the heels of your hand and you flip it over and you cover it with a cloth, a damp cloth, and you put it in a warm place to rise. You could smell yeast and chili and carrots in this kitchen. She said, how about some brownies? <laughs> she cooks when she's upset, and she was upset because her daughter was coming back to see her that evening from Minneapolis, her daughter Sarah, my cousin, who is an impulsive young person, and you never know what she's going to announce, what news she may have, what astonishing news. She may have met somebody in a grocery store and she's planning to marry them. Maybe she converted to Mormonism. Maybe she's taking up a new career as an aromatherapist in Sedona, Arizona. Who knows? Who knows? She's a kid and she goes off and does crazy things and she's at an age where advice is no good anymore. There's no more of that to be offered. You just sit and listen and you just pray constantly. <laughs> and you cook. And you cook. My Aunt Flo is a believer in the religion of cooking. She's of that old-fashioned generation that believes that every child has a God-given right to come home from school and arrive in a kitchen that is full of the fragrance of bread baking and cooking and be greeted by a mother who says, How was your day? And listens. And of course, that was a bygone era, and my Aunt Flo's children are of this era. And her beloved grandchildren, a great many of them, most of them, come home after school and unlock the back door and walk into a dark kitchen and take some kind of frozen pastry out of the freezer and put it into the toaster and boot up the computer and sit at the computer listening to music over headphones from their Walkman while watching a video on television and with the telephone talking to a friend. <laughs> she knows this and it grieves her no end, but what can you do? So we had the ginger juice, this one, this one ingredient of Grandma's miraculous mustard plaster. She thought, we'll go to the Lutheran church and the organist the organist. She is, believes in homeopathic medicine and she's kind of an organic gardener and I'll bet she has some of that homegrown mustard at home and then we'll worry about the goose grease later. We took off in her car. We were going to stop and see Mr. Neff at the Good Shepherd home and bring along some gingerbread for him and then at the last minute she filled up a Tupperware bowl with some chili and so we took this along to the old folks' home and walked in. And there was something about the smell of disinfectant and medications that set off this ferocious coughing. I just, <laughs> I doubled up. I just was coughing as hard as I possibly could. People turned away. People, people were horrified. People went into their rooms and closed the door because this cough is about death. This is a horrible cough. This is a cough that makes you think of, of old men pushing a grocery cart down the street with shopping bags full of stuff they've gleaned out of dumpsters. It's that kind of a cough. It's a cough that makes you think of the Civil War and, and, of, and of men dying of tuberculosis. It's a horrible cough. But it's good to have a cough because it is a taste of reality and we need a little reality. We drift through life on these beautiful illusions and 
fighting these silly battles for supremacy and power and prestige and then along comes a good cough and we see what the real deal is. (laughs) It's not about any of that. Life is short. Time does not stop and we are unbelievably small and unimportant and highly forgettable. We'd be amazed at how forgettable we are. You die and people look at your obit in the paper and if you were a great deal younger than they are, then they feel kind of a twinge, but if you weren't, they don't. (laughs) They go on and they deal with intimacy issues or whatever else they were thinking about and you were gone and all attempts to make people remember you are forlorn, hopeless attempts. Great memorials that are erected to events and great men to make future generations remember them are hopeless. The people who sit in the plazas of these great memorials, these great structures, are not thinking about the event or the great man. They're thinking about sex. (laughs) They're thinking about where to go for lunch. They're thinking about where to find a toilet. (laughs) That's what they're thinking about. The great wall in Washington, the polished stone wall with all the names on it. People are growing up now for whom that war is no more vivid than the War of 1812 and no memorial will ever make them think otherwise. You think about these things when you have a cough that bad. (laughs) We went off to the Lutheran church to look for the organist and here were all of the Lutheran women who were down in the basement and they were putting the finishing touches on their benefit supper to raise money to pay Mr. Sorensen's medical bills from when he fell off the barn roof and they were making baked beans and coleslaw and this wonderful pork roast and bars and coffee, all of these smells mingling. We walked in looking for Mrs. Markland and there she was and indeed she did have some of this mustard and she had it at home. She'd just go right home and get it. Good for her. She went home and here was Aunt Flo's daughter, Rebecca. And Rebecca has a new baby, Madeline, who is two months old, this beautiful little child who is too young to be afraid of strangers. And so she will be held by anybody and she will smile up at them. And it's a beautiful smile. And whether it's gas or whatever it's caused by, it's a beautiful smile. She's a beautiful child. She is the love object of all the old ladies of the Lutheran Church. Everybody vies to hold her. And for some reason, they passed her to me. I don't know why. I held this beautiful child in my arms. And then I felt this sort of turbulence. And I held her way off to the side and I turned my head the other way and I coughed, but these women, horrified, (laughs) ran up to me as if I were a typhoid carrier and they snatched the child out of my arms. It was a horrible, horrible, deep, phlegmy woof of a cough. And you could see what they were thinking. They were thinking, get this woofer out of here. (laughs) Well, we had two of the ingredients anyway. And then we went off to the Chatterbox Cafe. We thought maybe she'd have some goose grease, Dorothy. We went in, sat down at the counter, waited to talk to her. I felt another cough coming, and I coughed it. It was a horrible cough that made you think of Grandpa Joe dying in the back of the truck on the way out to California (laughs) in Grapes of Wrath. It was a horrible, (laughs) wrenching cough. Carl Kressbach was sitting right beside me. He pushed his grilled cheese sandwich away. (laughs) He didn't think he'd finish it. He paid up and he left. It was a desperate cough. (laughs) Dorothy had some goose grease, actually. She was going to take it over to the Lutheran church to put it in the baked beans, but she had a little bit extra. 
So we mixed up Grandma's wonderful plaster. It's not a handsome-looking thing, but there it was, kind of beige-colored, color of the universe. And <laughs> I went off in the toilet, and I put it on my chest, and I did start to feel better. I felt a great deal better almost right away. I felt good enough that I thought I could go to my Aunt Flo's granddaughter's piano recital, which was over at the high school. We were a little bit late, but she wanted to be sure and see Stephanie play her first piano recital. The auditorium was dark, and the doors were closed, and we tiptoed in, and it was about half full of people. And a little child was sitting on stage at a big piano, playing that beautiful piece to a wild rose. We sat down, and something about the smell of this mustard plaster <laughs> kind of got up my nose. And I kept telling myself, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't. And then I did it, of course. <laughs> this tremendous, deep woof of a cough that made you think of people in a lung cancer ward, those old men who sit holding lit cigarettes to their tracheotomy tubes. It was a horrible cough. And the child stopped. The child was almost to the end of that beautiful piece. Da, da, die, 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 die. Die, 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 dee, dee. Die, 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 die. The child was almost to the end and held her hands up, listened to the woof, and then started all over again at the beginning. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece of music. Beautiful piece of music to a wild rose. It was a great cough. I'm now over it, and that's why I can tell you about it. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good-looking, all the children are better. 